You want to see the experience, comic culture, and sales. Streaming live daily to Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us again on uh, the experience. We have a special guest today. His name is uh, Richard uh, Fairgray. And we're going to be ex- looking into his project, uh, the uh, x Files of Frankenstein. Kind of like a very uh, uh, interesting uh, 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 series there that we'll... Uh, we will get to in a bit. And also, we'll be having, uh, giving away, let's see, it was Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, another piece that Mog will be giving away later on today, and we'll tell you how you can win that. We've given away several pieces in the last few weeks, and uh, you know, it's just our way to share with the community to give back uh, a little bit and get you guys to come in and watch the show, okay, you know. And uh, I'm not sure what Mog is, is going to be drawing, uh, today, along with uh, Richard, we will find out very shortly, and uh, you know we'll talk a little bit about maybe about the Maui fires that's going on there, and there's a little bit of confusion as to like travel and stuff. But just want to mention that a little bit, uh, but we'll get into that. And so go ahead and stay with us. We'll be right back, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Hey, hey, Richard Fairgray, how are you doing? I am good. I'm in the middle of a heat wave, but other than that, I'm good. Where where are you anyway? I am at my place in Canada right now. Oh, um, in Canada. Oh, okay. Uh, so what I, I, I jump back and forth between here and LA. I'm, a, I'm always in the same time zone. I'm always on okay. Pacific time. Everyone, everyone always assumes that if you're in Canada, you're probably somewhere good. I'm not. I'm in Surrey, which is south of Vancouver. So it's oh, exactly no. the same time as LA. All right. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. So is that uh, where in uh, Canada? Is that like east, west, central? It's, it's on the west. Like I'm, I'm literally okay. directly north of LA. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. So, all right. So you're kind of like in the same time zone uh, as us. And you said you'd go back and forth between there and LA? Yeah. Yeah. And how often do you do that? Um, for the past seven years, I've been splitting my time 50-50. Oh, okay. So is, is it, do you spend like months at a time or is it like a weeks at a time? Uh, I'll usually do like in, in an ideal situation, like we're talking pre COVID ideal world. It was, I would do six weeks in LA and then two weeks up here and then kind of bank up a bunch of time up here over like Christmas and January when everything's dead down there. So, so what is it like? You have like two family families that you can uh, live with uh, in two different areas. How, how does no, that I just I, I have a place up here. Um, my husband is from Canada, and I annoyingly met him four days before I moved to America. And so uh, <laughs> he was never going to move, and I was never going to not be in L.A. because it's my favorite yeah. place on earth. Um, yeah. And so for, for seven years, we've just been jumping back and forth. So he does, he does the opposite of whatever I'm doing so that we end up spending about half our time together and half our time apart. Oh, okay, okay. But what, what is he in the industry too, or is, does he do something no. totally, different? totally different? No, he's a he's a um, he's a retired florist and uh, Great Dane breeder. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Okay, so, so up here I'm surrounded by flowers and giant dogs, and down there I'm surrounded by filth and garbage and familiar urine smells. What part of uh, L.A. are you in? Hollywood. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite well, place on earth. <laughs> When I first moved to uh, California, that, then that's where we're at, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I first lived on, on uh, Hollywood. I actually lived uh, very off of uh, Franklin, uh, mm-hmm. close to the um, Scientology, right? And, it, and that was back in the heyday when, uh, on Sundays, when they would get to have their get-togethers. That parking was tough. Mm-hmm. It was uh, hard to drive through there. Uh, oh, yeah. It was a, a that's real like that, that's. Over near Bronson, right? Like near the Gelson's? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Close to Bronson. Yeah. yeah. Franklin. I forgot what the main street is uh, that goes through there, but yeah. For a long time, I was um, I was on uh, Whitley, uh, at, like Whitley and Franklin, and yeah. uh, the Oaks okay. was the only place that did coffee after midnight. And so I would be walking down there whenever I was working. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is that everybody told me that I shouldn't be like walking there at night. 
but but I did right because uh, you know I didn't want to drive to you know go to some of the places that yeah. I was eating at because uh, parking is just tough. I didn't want to give up my parking and and then you know drive out come back and all of a sudden i'm starting to get like parking so i would i would always walk i'd walk to uh, uh the, to the restaurants that i would want to eat at or or, or whatever because i didn't have access to the kitchen at that time uh with the place that i where the, i was staying at how long ago were you there oh this was back in the uh this was back in like 85 i was only there for about a year mm -hmm. till i could get myself situated figure out where i uh, where I really wanted to live, I ended up getting an apartment out in Culver City, which was a block away from uh, where uh, I was working at, at the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was like a, a long time ago, but I still remember it. And uh, very finally, there was a Thai restaurant that I would uh, go to uh, uh, back then, which was serving like great food. I don't know, I don't think they're there anymore. But yeah, that was no. one of my uh, uh, joys uh, back there in, in Hollywood. Is, is so right? anyway, so you're bringing us uh, X, Y is a Frankenstein. Yeah. Right. Yes. Sorry. I could talk about Hollywood all night because like, I just, I haven't been there for about three weeks. And so I'm right at that point where I'm like shaky and missing it. Yeah. It's, it's a different field uh, now uh, yeah. because even like back then there used to be, um, uh, what was it? Like on Sunset and Hollywood, you would see the, like the, the hookers, they, you know, they were really working the strip and everything back mm -hmm. then. Right. That's not happening anymore. Right well, now. that's mostly shifted down to uh, the 7-Eleven on Santa Monica and uh, Los Angeles. Oh, so uh, they still are walking. I thought they went oh, to. Yeah. I thought they went totally like uh, mobile on the internet now. <laughs> I mean, sure, but like, there's always going to be people who do it do it the classic yeah. way, and it's yeah. nice. It, 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 yeah, yeah, those, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, why not? You get those walk-in customers. Did you, I mean, I know it's a long time ago, but, um, and so probably this is like more recent than that, but there was, there was a guy, um, a homeless guy on sunset who looked exactly like Willie Nelson. And when I met him, he was going by the name Willie. He had his own like hashtag on Instagram. Um, and he was just my favorite thing. I'd walk, I'd go by him every day on the way to work and we got talking. I found out he really liked comic books. So I started giving him my new books every time one came out. Um, and so we got chatting and then one day i saw him and he was just covered in gold like just gold jewelry everywhere and i said to him willie where did you get all that gold and he says oh well you know since stevie stevie wonder got his eyesight back he doesn't like his gold anymore so he gave it to me and i was like don't tell me anything else like that story is perfect i don't need to know the real version i'm so happy to imagine that, that is if it's true to you it's true to me from here on out and i've never seen him since so i like to think that he just traded in all the gold and bought a house <laughs> what a lucky guy <laughs> if, if that could only all happen to us <laughs> All right, so let's let's get into this uh, ex wives of uh, Frankenstein. Uh, that was just a how many issues you have? I think it's just one, right? That you have so far. Yeah, so uh, one issue. The first issue launches next week on Kickstarter next Thursday. Okay. Um, I've actually finished uh, all four of the first arc, but okay. um, you know I'm I'm still in my first year of Kickstarter, so I have to do that slow rollout where I have to fulfill before I start a new thing. So I'm like, yeah. got to print, got to send out, got to fulfill within a week, start the next one. I want to get monthly. Uh, and uh, have you? Uh, this is your very first Kickstarter, is that right? No, this is this is my third. Okay, um, so, I, so you've got you got a little uh, under your belt there. The, uh, yeah, this, this is also this is this is my two hundred and seventy fourth book though. So it's, oh, okay. it's third Kickstarter, two hundred and seventy fourth book. All right, all right. Now the uh, the cover, uh, the art on that that cover is really really nice. Who did that artwork there? Uh, that's that's Steph C. Oh, okay, all right. Um, she is. She did, did, she did everything, all, all colors and everything. She did all of that. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, um, I I had a cover artist who had some stuff going on, and there were some delays. And I'd been talking with Steph about doing a cover for a later issue, and then I just said, "Is there any chance you could do something within a week?" And she was like, "What What do you have in mind?" And I and she sent me a few sketches, and. Um, we sort of settled on this idea of like the two of them stitched together on the board, you know, kind of talking about the idea of like them sharing this experience, even though it's very different for each of them to have gone through. Uh, and then she posted on Twitter the next day, 
um, all of these reference photos from Death Becomes Her, which is one of my favorite movies. And I immediately was like, oh, oh, I never even mentioned that to her. And she immediately understood. She read the issue and understood the relationship these two have, like hating each other, but being so desperate to be understood that they can't let go of each other. And yeah, it was, it was like such a thrill to have, to meet someone on the internet who just understood what I was doing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. And um, so if I, the uh, title is ex wives. So mm -hmm. that's plural, right? So yeah. how many ex wives are we uh, doing here? Well, so the, um, the premise of the story is um, it's a modern reimagining of the Frankenstein story. Uh, where Elizabeth Frankenstein and uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, now going by Victoria, uh, spend the day together when they find out that their husbands are alive and have been living as a gay couple in the Arctic Circle where they disappeared and are now returning to the world as heroes of the MRA movement and Reddit. Okay. Whoa, interesting. Okay. Uh, just I'll take a little uh, break here to look at the comments. Hello, we would say hello to uh, uh, some of the guys that are here. Kenneth Bird, Ronald uh, Shepard, thanks again for uh, joining us. And Dave Cerrone, uh, looking forward to meeting up with you. And the same thing with Mr. Easy Go Lucky is here tonight. Um, rare appearance. Uh, good, good to have you back here uh, again. So have you tried to get uh, any feedback? on your uh, project here and, and what kind of reaction have you been getting? Um, I, it's been really good, actually. Um, I have a kind of a, a stable of people who I, who I send most of my things out to as I finish them. I'm, I'm, I'm a workaholic, and so I tend to get too much stuff done too fast. Like this, I have 14 books coming out this year, and so it's been a um, – there's a lot of overlap. Like I'm, I'm technically meant to be publicizing my book Four Color Heroes right now, um, but instead I'm talking about this one. Uh, but it's, it, yeah, it's, it's been very good. People are really enjoying it. Uh, someone, someone, uh, st said that it was, I had, I had, uh, disguised a French film as genre fiction, which felt really nice. Um, yeah. I tend to do like very conversational stuff and I'm really interested in like difficult friendships and finding ways to make really small moments feel uh, not necessarily cinematic, but really explore like the comic medium and what it can do. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what are we? What what kind of story are we looking at? Is this a, like a, a horror story, romantic story? Um, um, no, it's just very conversational. Like it's you know th this. Um, Victoria was was made for somebody, um, and she doesn't really know who she is as a person. She's existed from the point that she woke up as a fully grown adult. Um, and was confronted by a monster that she was expected to marry. Um, Elizabeth was in many ways also made for somebody in the original novel. She is gifted to Victor on his fifth birthday as an adopted sister, and he's told that she is here for his every pleasure. So there's this, a lot of exploration of like the pressure that's put on them to have been for somebody else. And then, you know, once those people are gone and once those people are, you know, villains, because a monster rampaged through the city and the man who created him defied all laws of nature by bringing something back from the dead. So now these two women are left behind to be, to bear the brunt of that while these two guys get to disappear and then later turn out to be alive. And by being, by now being a couple and proving that they can survive all of this and having been away while the heat died down, they get to come back and be celebrated while the two women are just kind of being harassed and blamed. Oh, okay. So that okay, that's a very uh, interesting uh, take. So it's uh, almost feeling like a slice of life in a twisted kind of way. Yeah, with, uh, yeah. Uh, with the uh, two uh, ex-wives here. Okay. So they okay. So they never really marry Frankenstein. Then. Um, in in my version of it, I mean, it it sort of gets complicated if you go across the different movies, different books with you know different like interpretations, and obviously in the original book. On the night that Victor creates the bride, he sees what he's doing is an abomination and he burns it. He sets the lab on fire and, and destroys the, the corpse before he reanimates it. And the monster sees this and then goes and that's when he kills Elizabeth. Uh, in the film, Elizabeth survives. And in the Bride of Frankenstein film, the bride is created at the very end of the film. She wakes up, she screams a lot. 
uh, the monster tries to like touch her. She screams some more and then they blow up the lab and they theoretically both die. Obviously there are many sequels. Um, but in my, my interpretation of it is like that all of that shit sort of happened in a modern day sense. And, uh, like Elizabeth and, and the bride both survived and they both did in fact marry their respective Frankenstein and monster out of a sort of sense of obligation. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of the in the the second arc um is where i start ex exploring the idea that uh victor and the monster want to get married now and they have to actually get divorced <laughs> so they have to come to the the ex-wives and say like we actually need to make this official we were just dead before <laughs> um so yeah i'm having i'm having a lot of fun playing playing like pretty fast and loose with the mythology to be honest <laughs> Okay, so is this a series? Is this series going to be like a limited series, a maxi series, or is this a an ongoing uh, kind of series? Uh, when I first imagined it, it was going to be a uh, a limited series, and I finished the the first um, story, which just kind of covers their first day together, and I realized like there's a lot of stuff I can do with these two characters, and I was really enjoying myself, so I. I have loose ideas. I like the idea of a divorce story. I like the idea of, um, like, how do they each, you know, beyond the first day, how does Elizabeth hold on to her wealth and her lifestyle now that her now that her dead husband is back? Does she have to conform to the expectations? Does she have to be super proud of her husband for coming out, um, or does she, can she actually be publicly angry and hurt? Uh, so. I have a lot of ideas and I would love to do more of it. I'm on another book already. I'm on another two books already. So I don't know if it'll happen immediately, but I mean, issue four will be on Kickstarter by I think May. Uh, and then at that point I can start thinking, do I want to do another one straight away or do I want to give some time between it? So it's all a little up in the air, but at very least there is one complete story. Okay. When did you say you're going to come out with issue four? Uh, issue four will come out in May. So it'll be, um, August 24th will be the launch of the first one. I think October 24th for the second. I've got a book I'm doing for Christmas uh, in December, and then I'll do January. I, oh, I might, yeah, I might do January and March for three and four because May I'm going to do uh, Volume Two of Haunted Hill. Okay, that's a, right. that's a quick, uh, pretty quick pace for a, a Kickstarter project. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's like a good thing to to really keep the interest of your uh, uh, of your readers. So, uh, bravo on that front there. And so um, we will be coming uh, right back. We're going to take a break uh, right now. And when we come back, uh, Mog will be, will, will be here. She will be uh, joining us. And then we'll review um, the artwork that we'll have available uh, for today. So don't go away. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Join the party. Head over to our link tree to find all the links for everywhere the experience is all the time. You just finished the last episode of your favorite new show and you just have to talk about it. But all your friends are ghosting you because of that incident last week at the buffet. Oh, you know the one. What you did to that chowder, ugh, keeps me up at night. So what do you do? Join writer Dan Wickline as he breaks down all your favorite pop culture media, whether it's a review of the latest nerdy TV show or a dive back into the history of your favorite comic characters, Dan's ready to discuss all the hottest topics live. Join the conversation as Dan live streams Tuesday through Thursday at 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. The Dan Wickline Show on The Experience. Comic Culture and Sales. There's something for every imagination at your local comic shop. Visit ComicShopLocator.com to find a store near you.
Welcome back, uh, guys. Um, let's see, his Mog is here, so we're glad to have her uh, finally uh, in here. And uh, the piece that we're going to be giving away today is Gamora. So let's say that uh, if you want to get in the, draw the free drawing for that, type in uh, pound sign Gamora, and that'll get you uh, qualified to win that piece. Okay. And, Mog, do you know what you're uh, going to be drawing today? Yeah, I'm going to do a... Uh... Classic uh, Catwoman. Okay, Mog will be doing a classic uh, Catwoman that you're going to be uh, uh, bidding on. We'll start the uh, bid uh, uh, really low for that one. Let's do that 25 uh, for today uh, for the starting bid. And uh, Richard, uh, will you be drawing something? I'm drawing right now, and it's actually, this is really nicely serendipitous. I'm drawing the Penguin. Um, so uh, we can we can okay. do a Batman Returns thing. Mel, if you want to draw sorry, Batman. Sorry. Uh, I, uh, Mel muted the whole audio, so you he can't hear anything. I'm not muted. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay good. We'll get, the, get that technical difficulty out of the way. Oh, and uh, Richard, it's a relief when I find that I didn't do it wrong, though. That's, that's, so that was so much. <laughs> <laughs> we have, my, my friend, we have, my friend uh, once said to me, that, that every time she hears a glass break at a party, she looks at me because I no one looks happier than me when I know that I'm not the person who broke something. Oh, Richard, <laughs> are, you, are you the type where you just automatically feel guilty even though you're innocent? Oh, 100 percent. Always. Like, like I would be terrible in an interrogation because I would behave like a guilty person because I'd be like, well, no, I didn't kill them. But like maybe something I did led to their murder. And like maybe I should just take the punishment anyway because I am garbage. You know, speaking of so funny you said that because uh, about murder, I was just curious today and I woke up looking up at um, the laws, like uh, what like the underage, you know, minor. Uh, mm -hmm. If you commit a crime as a minor, uh, do they charge you as an adult crime or do they just put you into like duty detention or something like that? Rehab, they call it, right? Yeah. And state by state, it's all different, the, the age limit. But I was so shocked. I was like, okay, let's check out Illinois, right? Because I was thinking Chicago, lots of crime. And in, in Illinois, the state, as of right now, there is no minor age limit. So even if you're like six years old and you shoot your parents, I mean, God forbid that happens, they will charge you and treat you like an uh, adult and put you in jail. So if Kevin had really succeeded in Home Alone, he would have been in serious trouble. Yes, <laughs> yes. But yeah. like certain states, oh my God, I was so surprised. Like in New York, <clears throat> New Jersey, they are, they're totally fine. Like. As long as you're under, I think it was 16, no, under 18, mm -hmm. they're, they're like, a, they're, they're very lenient. And the maximum sentence you can put them in a juvie uh, is five years. You cannot go longer than five years. Wow. Yeah. Then you also discovered that the youngest murderer is in what state? Michigan. And how old? 11 years old. Okay. This child was treated as a convicted as a as an adult. They treated like an adult. Yeah, so they, he got convicted as an adult, 11 years old. Oh. So the guy had accidentally, uh, according to his stories, that he uh, he was just shooting. He was he, he accidentally the gun, shot the gun off towards a tree. Yeah, and there happened to be a like an 18 year old uh, guy there that got hit in the head. Yeah. Right in the, uh, the guy that uh, shot the gun, and this happened in uh, 1998, was it? 1997. 1997. The guy that shot it was a, a colored boy. Okay. So we're trying to find the facts about the, the ethnicity of, of uh, the yeah. other boy that got killed, and we just couldn't find it. Well, so it, it feels like, like it feels like if a, if a white kid had been the shooter. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, right. Then, yeah, it, then they would have never gone to that far extent of the law. But yeah. because uh, it was a colored guy, uh, they did uh, pursue it uh, to the full extent. Yeah. And um, but it, what is what I found interesting is that they are actually trying to bury the fact that uh, or I'm assuming 
that the person that got killed was was a white person. Okay. Uh, be, yeah, because when Marg was telling me she found out that detail that it was an 11 year old, then I said, okay, my bet is um, that it was a colored guy and he probably shot uh, a white a white person. But mm -hmm. yeah, we couldn't quite uh, dig up that uh, information. But, but we uh -huh. haven't given up. We're still going to look for it, you know, because because we want to know. <laughs> Yeah. So to jump back to what I said when I was uh, muted, um, Mog, I love that you're drawing. But also, Mog, nice to meet you. Sorry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Richard, you look so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> um, she loves the beard. You look so cute. Yeah, well, I, I like to think so. <laughs> unfortunately, I can't grow one. Us yeah. Asians just have a hard time doing so, that. Um, so I, I was trying to say, I love that you're drawing Catwoman because I'm drawing the penguin. <gasps> oh. There you so, go. So if we can convince Mel to get a pen out and draw, draw Batman, we'll have a full Batman Returns trilogy. <laughs> oh, hey, Richard, uh, don't, do you want to... Uh, what do you want your starting uh, bid uh, to be on that piece? Oh, I have no idea. Well, I, I've never done a, an online auction. All right, what, let's do it. Let's start it at 25. How's that? Sure, sounds okay. good. All right, Whoa. okay, there you go. All right, so we've got a, uh, we got a, a cat woman and we got a penguin uh, from Richard that's going to go up for bid. Uh, and you can see uh, Monk has uh, started on that. So if you want to bid on any of those, just type in the name and the piece. And, oh, there's a penguin. Oh, and we're going for a kind of a... Oh, my God. Danny DeVito eating the fish. Danny DeVito yes. uh, a penguin there. There I we go. Him. Okay, so if you're into Danny DeVito, uh, that's a good one to get. You can type in penguin in your start, uh, opening bid of 25. Uh, or if you want the uh, Catwoman, just type in Catwoman in, in the uh, opening bit. All mm -hmm. right. Okay. And uh, we have a few guys that have uh, put in the uh, pound sign Gamora. Thanks, uh, mm -hmm. Philip and uh, Kenneth. They are now eligible to uh, win that uh, um, Gamora piece that we'll have a drawing for in the uh, uh, last segment of the show. So if you want to get in that action, go ahead and put that in. Pound sign Gamora. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but uh, Illinois having no age, like uh, the age bar thing, mm -hmm. uh, they say it's actually exceptionally rare, like worldwide even. So, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah, because, you know, we see the kids as being innocent. It's like even if they do something wrong, we, we tell ourselves better. that, they yeah. yeah, they don't know any better. They, have, they don't know... Uh, that concept of right and wrong, mm -hmm. right? So we give them the benefit of the doubt. Well, also, like, you just don't have, your brain is growing until you're 25. Your ability to make rational decisions is so different during that phase. Like, I don't think it's fair to hold people accountable to the same level. Like, obviously, if you're 18 and you do something terrible, it's still bad, but it's not as bad as if you're 30 and do something terrible, you know? Yes. Yeah, where you're fully aware. Because, come on, think about it. When you're, say... 17, right? Richard, mm -hmm. Weren't your hormones raging so much? It pretty much dictated your whole persona. Oh my God. Like the, like I've only, I've only been arrested once in my life and it was when I was 14. And like, okay. I think about how stupid I was being and how lucky I was that like, like it all worked out. Um, yeah. Every like, there is a number of times in my life where I've been watching the news and a story has come up about someone being like caught for something. And my first yeah. thought is, Oh shit. I hope that's not someone I know. <laughs> okay. You know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. You, you know, um, either way it sucks to, like, mm. I'm going to tell you, like I, I have so many, so much regrets, uh, for, in my teen years. Like I wish I could erase that past completely. Oh, really? Like what? Uh, I'll never tell you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. I, I, the only things I regret are uh, times I've wasted, like waiting around for other people. I, you know, I don't regret any of the stupid things I've done. I don't regret any of my adventures, but I certainly regret like letting myself get held back by other people and their uh, ideas of what, what people should want from their lives. Oh. Yeah, I kind of have this same feeling as well, but um, it's it's um, it's mainly me that was holding myself back, <laughs> and you know, not having that confidence to you know put yourself uh, forward. You know? 
but I, I eventually did overcome that. And um, yeah. now, now I, I. Do you think that could be a societal thing as a man? Because uh, like your pressure to already, you know, be able to become a provider and, and achievements is so important. I mean, achievement is like and accomplishments tied in with like confidence. And therefore, you guys are like, oh, wish shit. Like, I wish I was more confident. Both of you guys answer similar actually. I, I don't I think for me it wasn't about uh, those kinds of expectations. Like I think it was more uh, I I honestly never really felt that stuff, but I was always the person who I would quite often ask people, Hey, why did this thing happen? And they would roll their eyes and say, Oh, Richard, you're just weird. And it'll be like, here's a thing you're just meant to know, a thing you're just meant to understand, and I just never did. Um, but I had a, a, a collaborator for many years um, who like had a very boring life. He was um, a fully grown adult who I started working with when I was 15. Um, and I'd never met a happy adult. So I just assumed I will grow up and become boring and, and unhappy like this man, yeah. but we can sort of have some fun making comics. Yeah. And then when I started actually like pursuing this professionally and having some success, yeah. he got very like, not like he got he basically I, I did a book that he had said was a stupid idea and he wouldn't want to have any part of and i was like cool i'll do it on my own and then uh immediately that book got optioned and uh picked up by a publisher and immediately he was like oh can i come and be on that book i've always thought it was a great idea <laughs> um and because i was 21 and he was like he'd been my best friend since i was 15 i said of course i would love to have you come along for this adventure yes and he wasn't he didn't he didn't want you know like it took a long time but eventually it was i'm going to move to america i'm going to live in la there's interest in this book i've got a publishing deal there we're going to be pursuing it for tv and he yeah. said oh i never really wanted that I just thought we were having fun making comics. And I'm like, I've dedicated my entire life to making comics. Why did you think this was a hobby to me? Yeah. Uh, and like that's, that, those are my regrets, it's wasting that time. Ah, oh. it does sounds like a, a misjudge of a character or misplaced, what do you call that, misplaced trust now? Misplaced trust, is that what it's called? I don't know if I would go that far. It's, it's part of our, to me, it's just part of growth in understanding people. Yeah. 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 I think it, it took me a really long time to realize that not everyone wants the same things as me no. and that that's okay. But I think also a lot of people need to, if they don't want the thing that you're working towards, they shouldn't pretend they do. Right. Uh, then were you, speaking of that, then were you always kind of, you knew what you wanted to do? You knew what you liked? You what wish you watched you? Yeah, I like I've I've actually I have never really had another job. Like um, I worked as a stand-up comedian uh, briefly at the end of high school and through college. Um, and I, for three months, I did uh, I worked as a substitute teacher while I was editing a film. Um, but like, comics have always been the only thing I've done, really. Oh, okay. That's kind of kind of. Yes. So, what kind of uh, comics were you uh, into? At that time, um, I didn't really get into comics so much. So I, I grew up in New Zealand, where there were four comic stores. So I didn't actually like touch a comic book until I was like seventeen, I think. Okay. Uh, and so I, I kind of knew they existed, but I didn't really know much beyond that. And I just kind of started making them and printing them and selling them at weird events and things, and like not making not making what you'd call real money by adult standards, but like certainly enough to buy a lot of Power Rangers toys. Uh -huh. um, and then when I, I stumbled into my first comic convention, and then after that I was like, oh, there are comics here. I can find out about this. I can do this properly. And I just did the usual thing of like, I will immediately read Sandman and Dark Knight and uh, like go on eBay and track down every issue of Miracle Man because I've been told it's good and then have a brief teen goth phase with I Feel Sick and Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and all of that stuff. Um, and then it was like, I don't know, just kind of like a smattering of everything everywhere. And now I'm sort of, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 38, so I'm not that old, but it's very confronting that I'm the same age as Homer Simpson. Um, and I'm <laughs> in this like 
I need to just reread all the stuff I used to love to see if I can figure out whether it's good or if I was like just an idiot. So I'm sort of just buying up old collections now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hello, well, Val. Welcome, Val. Uh, and JD is saying, as mis as a miserable, boring person, I can say we're better among our own kind. Yeah, a and we are. And that's uh, kind of, a, for me, that's kind of like broad because uh, I do have a broad spectrum of friends. Not everybody uh, I can fit into one category. I have several categories. I have several groups of friends that come from different areas um, uh, from from my life. I got my high school friends. I got my church friends. Yeah. I got the uh, uh, friends uh, in the comic industry. I got the friends that uh, when I was working uh, corporate, I had a corporate job. Um, I got my friends uh, from the military. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a kind of a, uh, um, a bit of a, a spectrum there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying really hard to capture the kind of greasiness and messiness of Danny DeVito's hair. Yeah. <laughs> I think you, I think you're getting it. <laughs> I have uh, the, this next the next book I'm doing after X Wives of Frankenstein is. Uh, let's just say I've drawn a lot of pictures of Danny DeVito as the Penguin recently, um, for what is probably going to be my least marketable and grossest book that I'm probably the most excited about of anything I've ever done. <laughs> Who does the, um, do you do the interior for the uh, uh, X-Wives of Frankenstein? Is that your yeah. art in there? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That is so cool. An actual creator, like, who is Doing everything. it all. Do you know how rare that is to have a person who does writing and the art? And all of that? It's just incredibly rare. So. Well, I think, I just, I just realized that, like, it's, there's, no one's going to, no one's going to keep up with like my output and like now we're in an age now where everyone like kickstarts comics and, and, and pays their artists for their, their work and everything's sort of done in this, like, like a very, a very good way that has a whole bunch of new problems. Um, but like when I was coming up, it was like, if you knew someone who could draw, that was already rare. If you knew someone who could draw but was also willing to draw comics and understood sequential storytelling, that was almost impossible. And because there wasn't Kickstarter, your only option was to sell through the convention. So it had to either be, we will both do this for free and hope to make money later. Or it was, uh, I will somehow, I, I will work a day job and pay you to draw this thing and we will put out five pages a year. And neither of those things sort of felt viable to me. And I, like, I don't think I'm a great artist. I think I'm a good storyteller. Um, and so I just, like, I just have spent all of my time figuring out how to make my weird style work. Mm, okay. And um, it's uh, fortunate that, uh, because the industry didn't start that way. I mean, we've always appreciated art, but not in the way that we do now. Mm -hmm. That's uh, kind of like built up uh, through the uh, through the decades. Uh, I remember going to cons, and that's and it was great that we actually started having conventions to go to, go to because because you're right, you know, to find somebody that could draw was was rare, right? It's not it was not a profession that uh, um, you would choose to, to get into, right? Yeah. So when the conventions started coming around and we start seeing this uh, uh, great art that these guys are uh, bringing out, right? Then, you know, we, you know, we started taking a take a look at it. And back then, uh, back in the eighties, you could buy pages for under a hundred dollars easily, and even below fifty dollars, and it would be mm -hmm. a great page. Um, but um, yeah, uh, and if I, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If I knew now. <laughs> What I what I had known back then, I'd be buying those pages up left and right. Um, what you need to do is get get good at figuring out what names are hard to spell, and look on eBay because like pages pages of um, I picked up four pages of Promethea that were misspelled as Prometha uh, for under hundred dollars each because no one was bidding on them. Um, I have. Uh, 
I got a, I have like, I don't know. I know I like this makes me sound like such a nerd. So I'm sort of like holding back. And I'm like, I'm talking, I'm talking to nerds. It's fine. Um, yeah. That's my, what the show is about. My favorite artist, uh, like of all time, and I, I don't think he's actually the best. He's just my favorite because of the comics he worked on is uh, Kurt Schaffenberger. I love Silver Age comics. I love the goofiness of his stuff. And because no one can spell Schaffenberger, I have picked up so many pages for like 35 bucks a piece. And these things are worth significantly more than that like pages of superman pages of shazam i've got a page of like a, it's like um lex luther escaping from jail with spring shoes and bouncing over a wall and i got it for 35 wow. bucks wow that's a that's a great uh, tip there to be sharing so yeah and not a lot of people are familiar with that name you know unless you've uh, uh, gone back and look at uh, you know, so so rage and become familiar with that and so that's yeah and uh, even if you go beyond that um, like some of the golden age uh, artists they're, they've, they've done some great stuff as well if you can find that in that uh, it, it, it's hard but, uh, i've tried looking at that i've tried looking at some of the uh, other artists as well that uh, are from the uh, international uh, countries because uh, they were putting out some uh, good art too especially i like the ones from the philippines and that's the ones that i tend to focus on and it's it's just not possible. I mean, even some of those names, like you would say, uh, is hard to spell uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of times the pronunciation doesn't uh, come through in the spelling. Well, the the trick is it's not about it's not about figuring out how to spell it right. It's about trying to second guess how someone would spell it wrong. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that way you find the thing that no one's bidding on. There you go. There you go. All right. That's sad. That. <laughs> People can't spell. Uh, or, or, well for me, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> it could be that they're, oh they're trying God. to, you know, but uh, <sighs> you know, they're typing too fast. I mean, because that's like, for me, that's one, like one of my biggest mistakes is that oh, yeah. I'm typing yeah, and, the phone. and I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm trying to make these comments or, or, or stuff on there. And then, you know, I think it's been, and I put it through, and then I go back later. Oh, my God, I spelled it wrong. And it's been up there for like a couple hours already. <laughs> so I'll go back and uh, yeah. um, uh, correct it. That's true. Oh, anyway, thank you guys. Yeah. Um, I think uh, <laughs> we got you, uh, Ronald. Uh, yeah, Ron, uh, put it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you I mean, want to win that Steve, Gamora piece, Steve, uh, you follow yeah. these guys that are putting in pound sign Gamora mm -hmm. to win that uh, the Gamora piece that Mog has already mm -hmm. pre-done. And uh, JD can uh, bring that up for you guys to take a look at on that. And Cthulhu is one uh, that is gets spelled differently out, out there too. Mm -hmm. it, it is confusing. Yeah. So you're right about that. I've seen many different spellings out there with the. Uh, I think a lot of times they'll, they'll put a, like a double L on there. Yeah. And Val is in the running for the uh, Gamora piece. All right, Val, we got you. Yeah. That's great. Uh -huh. and so, um, Richard, do you do shows as well? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I love conventions. They're kind of, they're my favorite thing about all of this. Um, I've actually, I've got, I've got three in a row coming up. I'm doing Long Beach Comic Con. Okay. then flying over to Baltimore for Baltimore Comic-Con, then flying back to LA for a day, picking up more stock, flying to Vancouver, and then flying to Edmonton for Edmonton Fan Expo. Mm -hmm. And then I think I get, I like, af after that, my signing tour for Four Color Heroes kicks off, so I'm around LA in, like, seven different places. Mm -hmm. And then immediately from that ending, I go to London for, or go to, I go to London for a week to do publishing stuff, and then I go up to Harrogate for Thought Bubble, and then Paris for a few days, and then back to LA for. Oh, look at this man! He's an no, not, not trying to go to San Francisco for Fan Expo, and then LA for LA Comic Con, and then I get, then I can come back and make books again. All right. You know, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, thank you, Ronald. You put a bid on both of our work, mm -hmm. so. Thanks for that. Richard, sure this is your first time, so it's gonna be good. Yes. That, thank that you. is exciting. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Ronald's uh, uh, been a, a good uh, follower of the show and uh, other shows on the experience. And uh, hopefully you guys were uh, tuning in 
all of uh, last week and uh, a little bit more where we were giving away 200 slab CGC comics and we gave away a uh, Vampirilla piece uh, last week on our show. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, hit that follow button on a, on a YouTube channel. Uh, check out the other shows that we have on here. Uh, we've been nominated for several awards for the CBC Awards, uh, and we're lucky that uh, our show Sketch Up with uh, Marty Bell is uh, one of the four shows, along with the channel, uh, the experience. So you're getting great content here, and hopefully you'll uh, stay with us. 20. Okay, I stand corrected. 20 slab books. Not too Yeah, hard. yeah, 200, yeah. It felt <laughs> like you were giving away so much. <laughs> ah, yes. So I'm not sure when uh, yeah. we'll do in the next celebration. Maybe it'll be like 2,500. We'll give away 25. So we'll see what happens there. Right, so, so here, here's the basic inks for Danny. There you go. So I'll, I'll start doing the I'll start doing the colors now. Fantastic. I'm trying to really capture the orange on the fish. All right. And uh, Mog, you can see Mog's there and. She's, she likes to put, even though she's a dongler, she draws a lot of cats. Well, it's cat women, yeah. so. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, of course, that's befitting. So, anyway, on that note, we're going to take a, a quick break here and we'll be right back and uh, we'll look into those. We currently have a bid on both these pieces at $25, but if you want to place a bid, type in the name of the piece with the uh, your bid. After that, we are taking that in increments of five. All right, we'll be right back and uh, we'll see you guys then. Did you know that every experience show, including some exclusive content, streams on Twitch? Check it out. Twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. Or just scan that QR code. Comic Collectibles is a pretty straightforward show. You got Rex here. He sells the comics. And you got Rock and Robbie. He knows about the comics. And finally, John, he... Uh, well, no one really knows what John does. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's a great guy, but he just keeps showing up. Come to think of it, I don't even really know how he gets in here. Anyway, awesome comics, rare books, rarer signatures, slabbed books, and amazing cover sketches by Ken Hazer and others. Simple formula, you want the comics, you buy the comics. To sum up, Rex sells the comics, Robbie knows the comics, and John, who might possibly be a ghost. I mean, seriously, has anyone ever seen him show up or leave? Comic Collectibles with Rex and John, Mondays from 6 to 8 Eastern on The Experience. Comic Culture and Sales. You know how when you go to Comic-Con, after Comic-Con, you go to the hotel bar, and there's a whole bunch of people playing music and dancing, and you've got Pikachu and Lara Croft Tomb Raider doing the cha-cha slide just down from Deadpool and Batman and Wonder Woman? That's every Saturday night over on the Experience Twitch channel. Join Taji Beats for the EXP Dance Party, exclusively on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. According to a statistic that I just made up, people spend four hours a day changing the television channel. People who watch The Experience don't do that. Save yourself a ton of time by tuning into The Experience and enjoying our new original programming seven days a week. And then tell your friends. Think about the money they could save on batteries in the remote alone just by tuning into The Experience. Find out more by scanning the QR code below. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good night there. And okay, that's just Ron saying uh, hello to Mister uh, Easy Go uh, Go Lucky there. Yeah, it really. But you know, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was gonna say, you know, after listening to Richard, like it was no joke when he said, uh, I mean, when he said you're a workaholic, <laughs> you just like go go go. Like, do you even sleep? Do you sleep four hours a day? I do four and a half at night. Um, 
Yeah. When I'm when I like when I'm when I'm here in Canada, when I'm when I'm with, when I'm with my husband, I do four and a half a night. When I'm in LA, I try and do three a night and then a ninety minute nap in the middle of the day, because um, I find that I can be a little more productive that way. Um, when I used to share my office with this engineer, he had a sleep apnea machine. He would he would stay at the office two nights a week um, because he lived in Santa Barbara, but he worked across the street from the office, so he'd come in and he'd stay there two nights a week, and I had yeah. the office the rest of the time. Yeah. Um, but he had his sleep apnea machine there. So okay. I was like, I'm going to try this thing out, right? Yeah. And so I start using it. And yeah. because I don't have sleep apnea, I'm just getting like loaded with oxygen while I sleep. I'm getting five yeah. times the amount that I would normally get. I'm just breathing super well. <laughs> and it took some time, but I managed to get to a point where I was sleeping 90 minutes a day. And it was amazing. And I got so much work done. And then uh, <laughs> when he, he moved to Nashville, <laughs> And he said, like, are you going to miss me? I said, I'm going to miss your sleep apnea machine. And he was so disgusted that I had been using it. And I was like, I wiped it every time. Like, it's fine. So, and, like, I keep wanting to, like, buy my own. But it's like I had that one for free for so long. It feels <laughs> like I deserve a free one, you know? Those things are not cheap. Maybe you should. Uh, they're cheaper can't... now, but they're still not cheap. Well, it's like I bought 144 pairs of socks for $144 when I was 22. And one, that's a stupid amount of socks and I had nowhere to put them. But like since then, anytime I pay more than a dollar for a pair of socks, I feel like I'm getting scammed. I agree with you, right? I'm, I'm like much older. So, I, you know, I'm from the era where things were, were pretty cheap, like flip flops, right? We mm -hmm. get those for like 50 cents and now they want like 10 bucks, $26. And oh. I see some of this stuff that's going for like 140 no. Have you seen the, the ones that are in a vending machine now because they're fashion? What? Yeah, what? they have vending machine flip flops now. Yeah, that's just that's just not right in my book. Man. Oh no, I've got a confession. Yeah. I was thinking of flip flip flops. Mm -hmm. Uh I was washing your cheap slipper. Okay. Well not so cheap slipper. Yeah. Uh they got shredded. I'm sorry. All right, see, okay, now those I got for a dollar. Really? Yeah. That was a dollar. I thought you said you paid a lot for that. Which one are you talking about? The blue ones? Yeah, the one you were wearing all the time. No, that was that was I got from Daiso. You know, so they no, you said there. this one was special. You paid like fifteen bucks for it. No, 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 no. You I was so proud because I did like not want. Petty. No, no, no. I didn't want to pay a lot of money for that. So now, hang on. Like, I'm from Daiso. They're, they're a dollar, and these are these are just slippers that we use inside the house. We don't use them on the outside. It's, I just want to. I want to ask though, Mog, like the. Your your concern over the fifteen dollars slippers is this why you were looking up the legality of murder? Where you're like figuring out what hell to get away with? Yeah, I actually wasn't gonna say anything, but uh, now that it's officially in air, and you know, you guys brought up the flip flop, and I took this opportunity to make a confession. <laughs> I wanted to get that. I honestly was like just gonna never say anything. You know? I'm sorry. <laughs> totally shredded. No, I'm sorry. The show is canceled. Well, that's that's cool. Now I now I get to I get to go out tomorrow and do some shoppings and go get a a, a slipper from Daiso, which is you right, right next to my favorite uh, ice cream shop, so I can stop in there and, and, and get an ice cream from as well. <laughs> oh, uh, BBB wants it. It says you can bid. Yes. Yeah. So far, it's uh, twenty-five dollars for my vintage Catwoman, and Richard is doing kind of a vintage '80s um, Penguin Man. He's, yeah, he's doing he's Danny working. DeVito yeah. Penguin, and he's doing a great job at it. Yes. Both these pieces have a bid of twenty-five dollars, and he's starting to color it now, so it's really, really coming to life. So I'm trying to make it as large uh, as as possible just like jd said we are taking bids of uh in a five dollar increments so, yeah. so whatever you want to bid on there yeah and just put it down in the uh comments uh, with your bid so it sounds like you know uh richard you're very similar to mel but you know of course much younger <laughs> you guys are all about productivity it's like you have um like nitro running in your bloodstream like work 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 you can feel the time ticking. It's all about efficiency, productivity. And look, we're just talking right now, and he already finished more than me. And I started, you know, much later. Yeah, much. I started a bit late, but still. And that's that's like a big size paper. 
No. Oh, no, it's not. It's, it's a small piece on a big piece of cardboard. Uh, so I'm cheating. It? It's, it's like eight and a half by 11. That's still pretty big because mine is half the size of that. What is yours? Uh, five by seven? Oh, yes. Estimate okay. kind of like that. Yeah, five by seven. Well, like six, something like that. Yeah. All right. But that's incredible. Like how he just cranks everything out. So I'm curious. I was like always curious, like watching Mel and people like him. And also, I think it's similar. It's like, you guys, is this true? Is it in your head like time? It's like uh, runs two times faster the speed. Everything in the world is like running two times faster than everybody else. Because you know how sometimes when we watch YouTube, we speed it up. Because yeah. like, yeah, yeah, hurry up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never watched a video online that I haven't jumped around to find the bit that's worthwhile. Oh my gosh, that's so similar to, yeah. I, I, get, I get bored really easily. Um, and I need to, I, like, I kind of, I don't watch TV. I watch 12 minutes of TV a day for new stuff. I just watch, I have 12 minutes to eat my breakfast each morning and I watch TV. Although now, because I'm busy at the moment, I've cut that out and I'm now eating my breakfast while I pace back and forth in my hallway to get my steps in for the day. Um, oh my gosh. Just, just so I have like a few more minutes to, to work. Um, but like, I, I, I will, I will always have like something playing in the background that I have seen before and I don't have to pay attention to. Like, I'll just leave like anything that ran for long enough, like Dawson's Creek or One Tree Hill or Boy Meets World, just playing on a loop for months at a time yeah. while I just like power through books. Like last year, I was doing, um, I was working, I was working on this book that was it was meant to take two or three months, and then I decided to change the style and make it wildly more complicated and like the most densely detailed book I'd ever done and do sort of almost realistic coloring on the whole thing. And yeah. uh, it took nine months of no days off, minimum 20 hours a day working. It was the happiest I've ever been. <laughs> oh my God, Richard, <laughs> Jesus. So you get anxiety when you're on vacation? <laughs> I, I don't know, I haven't done that yet. I haven't tried that. Um, like. I sort of I sort of went on vacation for my honeymoon, but like I went to New York, so it was all meetings with publishers and putting together pitches and things. And I would do like one fun thing each morning with my husband while I brainstormed ideas on on trains. Mm -hmm. Jesus, your husband was cool with that. Yeah, um, he really. I mean, I've 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 always been like this since we got together. So he's very much just like. He knows that I'm happiest when I'm working. He knows that I'm excited when I'm talking about stories, um, and he knows that like I will put in the I'll put in the quantity time, you know. But he knows that when I, if I'm doing nothing, it's because I'm thinking about seven other things. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's like. Do you think it, it slowed down a bit? Do you think <laughs> as you get older? I haven't yet. No. No, um, like I was, I was talking about this today. Actually, um, back in back in 2018, I was working on a book. Uh, it was a monthly book, and I was writing, drawing, and coloring it. And yeah. it was 32 pages a month, uh, plus two variant covers, okay. and that I had to do all of. And um, then I was uh, I was planning my wedding. We we're having a horror themed wedding, so I was building a haunted house, and. Oh right in the middle of that uh i found out that the company that i was that was publishing this book who were paying me to do this uh were being sued by one of their other people and they were like shutting everything down because they had to put all their money into legal fees because they were definitely in the wrong yeah. um and so suddenly they were like they they actually told me at long beach comic-con um a customer said oh you've got six issues here how long is the series going to run for and the uh, publisher standing behind me before I could answer said, oh, this is the last issue. And that was how I found out that I was sort of fired. Um, and so that was why kind of why my honeymoon became all about pitching to publishers. And I ended up selling a, a series while I was out in New York. And um, I got it's basically an editor who I'd worked for uh, when I was doing picture books, heard that I was going to be in town. Um, reached out to me and said hey i can't tell you anything it's top secret but can you come in for a meeting and just think of a series and i was like sure that sounds fun so i go in and it's like this um hedge fund in china is, had like started a media company called like crossbridge media group 
and they were buying up studios and small publishers and like basically secretly establishing this huge foothold in America. And they wanted to have one flagship publisher and they wanted to publish a line of graphic novels where the it was all aimed for ages two through 12 and uh, any concept they were interested in had to be viable for at least a hundred volumes so they could sell it for TV. And they said, do you have anything? And I didn't. So I lied and said, absolutely. And I started kind of retelling the story of the first time I ever saw a ghost. And um, then, then like, as I was telling it, I was coming up with things and I was like, and uh, you know, and I get to the end of the ghost story and I said, and so obviously in this story, you know, you introduce a best friend, you have the two cousins, the main boy and the best friend. So it's the four of them trapped at this haunted beach. The beach has black sand, which is magnetic, so they can move it around and kind of weaponize it at certain points. Um, and they can also, uh, also obviously in real life, the black sand is iron, but in the story, the black sand is a dimension of darkness, losing its way through and corrupting and mutating everything it touches. So you get kind of a monster of the week kind of structure to it. And so they buy this book in the room. They say, how many books do you want to sign on for? And I said, I want to do three 64-page graphic novels. So I don't want to commit to anything long-term because I don't know what's going on with Blast of They say, sure. They come back with an official deal memo, and they want two books. So I'm very disappointed, and I assume, oh, I guess they don't want that. Yeah. It, they don't want it as much as they said, but whatever. Yeah. We're meeting my page rate. It was fine. Yeah. Um, the deadline for book one is uh, April 1st. I'm like, well, it's a 64 page book. I'll start at January 1st. That will give me plenty of time. It'll be the easiest thing I've ever done. Yeah. January 1st, I start writing the script. Um, I, about January 5th, they send off the first few pages. I'm kind of finishing off another thing at the same time that like I just had let run on a little. And the editor reached out. She's like, Richard, I'm really worried. Like you need to be working a lot faster than this. I'm like, what? I really don't though. Like this is easy. And, she, yeah. and I said, 64 pages. And she said, Richard, did you read your contract? Like you said, you wanted to do three 64 page stories. Each book is 192 pages. Oh no. So um, across the course of 87 days, I wrote, drew, colored and lettered 192 pages plus a cover, plus produced two animated trailers <laughs> for this fucking book. And I like I just moved into my office full time. Bulk ordered water and adult premium body wipes because I was like I can't I don't have time to go home and shower. I'll just wipe myself down with these things. And I found this website that had a great discount on them because they were like off brand and like not good. So now I have like a chemical burn scar that I have to explain to every intimate partner. Um, but like it was the most fun I'd ever had at the time. Like I got to be obsessed with my book for that much time. But I was thinking about it uh, today. Because 192 pages in 87 days is actually now pretty slow for me. Like, oh my God. Get out of here. Like, the idea that I would do less than 60 pages in a month. Like, X Wives of Frankenstein issue four is four and a half days for 22 pages of comic. Like, like I mean, I'm doing a different style now. It's a little sloppier. I'm not doing digital coloring anymore if I can help it um, because I genuinely hate working digitally. But, like, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm getting faster the older I get, and I, I think the work is getting better, too, or I hope it is. Well, I, I think you're just gaining the experience. You're finding ways on how you can uh, do it faster, which is what a, a lot of artists do, because you know you've understand the process, and you see where you can, like, cut corners. Um, but, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting um, that uh, you like going the uh, traditional way, right, because that, that's the way that, well, we like. So that, that's good to hear. Welcome, Chicago Schultz. Oh, yeah. Thank you for uh, joining the show uh, tonight. <laughs> Glad to have you. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that was very interesting. But the pace that you're going at, that's actually like a monster pace to yeah. compare to most people but, on uh, what they, uh, as far as like pages that they can uh, turn out there. But that's the best way to grow is like if you go outside your comfort zone, uh, you grow it exponentially. So, exactly. And like, I want to say, not to like defend my work because I don't think that was what the thing was about. But like, I actually one thing about me is I can't cut corners. The second I cut a corner, hmm. I immediately stop caring about the thing. Like, like I have a friend Eddie who uh, he does a comic strip that is a sort of autobiographical thing, and he has like full sleeve tattoos, and uh, he's like, oh yeah, I just cut and paste them for each strip. Like I'm never gonna redraw those. And I looked at like the original art for the strips, and it's like. 
it's really empty and feels like I mean, it, you know, it's it's well drawn, but it feels really empty um, yeah. because he does so many pieces that he just puts in, drops in later. And I said, like the second that I had a, a a finished page that didn't look finished, I would stop caring and I would never get around to drawing the next one. Like, is why I can't do comic strips. Um, I did a comic strip in college that ran for like uh, seven hey, seven strips. The first strip, fully detailed, two people standing in a room talking, really well-realized environment. Um, by the third strip, uh, one of them was hiding under the table and his word balloons were just coming out of the table. By the fifth strip, they'd both gone into a closet and I was just drawing the words coming out of the door. And then the seventh strip was literally just the word balloons and I bucket filled the black to be like, I'm just inside the closet now. I don't have to draw them. I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. It's all the same. The panel layouts are the same every time. I like my whole thing is I, I need to, I, I, I will do my, I'll, I'll write my script. I'll do my layouts. And then when I get to draw the page, I will be like, okay, how can I fuck this up? How can I make this significantly better? How can I completely reimagine this page? I know where it starts and I know where it ends. That's what layouts help me do. But I need to do it new right now. Otherwise, I'm going to feel like I'm redrawing something that I've already scribbled on a whiteboard. You know, that's that's kind of goes against the uh, efficiency I thought, you know, you would you pine for. But actually, you're not really going for efficiency. You're going for good quality and mad work hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. copy and paste it because it saves me time so I can go to the next one. But wow, I didn't know you had that sign. In you. That's incredible. I just, I just like, I can't stand the, like, if I draw, if I have to draw a page that is like, let's say, a large crowd scene from a high angle with cobblestone streets and weird old brick buildings at strange angles. It'll yeah. take me probably eight or nine hours to ink that. Um, I can I can probably pencil it pretty fast. Like once I get the lines in, I don't have to draw the cobblestones or the brickwork. I can make that up in, in the inking stage, right? But like the inking will take eight or nine hours. Um, if I have to draw uh, four panels with no backgrounds of one person talking in kind of mid close up or, or close ups on their face. It'll take me time Sorry. because I will get like so bored, uh, like staring at it that I'll just get distracted and just be like doing a Sudoku on my phone or whatever. You know, and now that like Cordal has introduced Octordal and I have to solve twice as many puzzles each day, like, I mean, <laughs> fortunately, that only eats into my poop time, but. It doesn't eat into it. I do the two at once. I'll be honest. That's the efficiency. You know, I would just, this is just uh, curiosity. If you sleep only like four and a half hours or four hours a day, mm -hmm. you can still poo regularly. My bowels are a mess. I actually like just a disaster. Okay. That's what I thought. Because I think it, it's like a fascinating effect if you don't sleep healthy. Um, the 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 bowel problems predate the sleep uh by quite a while and it hasn't made it any worse but uh my my, my guts are a mystery <laughs> yeah i'm uh, i'm in good shape i have a uh, i have a regular routine and uh it's pretty consistent i um i ate i ate popcorn at the barbie movie on sunday and uh monday tuesday wednesday were pretty bad oh my gosh wait you don't even eat? You forget to eat? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I eat. I'm just saying, like, I ate popcorn, so it wrecked me. Okay. No, I thought yeah. you only ate popcorn like two days ago, and that's all you ate. <laughs> no, 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 no. I also had a bucket of KFC. I'm a real healthy boy. Oh, okay. You know when Mog, uh, Mog <laughs> speaks freely about stuff like this. So, yeah, welcome to Poo Talk. No, I just <laughs> Who curious. knows what it's, it's going to be uh, it, in the next five no, minutes? Richard. Richard Hopefully was, it doesn't get any deeper than that. We should talk about you know being or else know, we'll be in deep shit. He brought it up first. He brought up number two. Yeah, listen, I can I can I can give detail if you need. Yeah, I, I don't mind detail. We don't need detail. We I, don't I need detail. details. No, no. So As I have a, there's an issue says, I think Taco no, Bell, good for the soul, bad for the whole. I think people are complaining. They're saying please no, like I don't, I don't have a problem with uh, yeah, Taco Bell. Yeah, I think Bell. Richard, we gotta follow that part. You know, <laughs> oh, you can talk about it, but you know, kinda of be a little Maybe they're discreet. eating. Maybe they're eating right now, so you know, some of them. Uh, yeah. so, All right, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll stop have talking you had about dinner food. already, Richard. 
Um, yeah, I had lamb chops. <gasps> you cooked it? No, 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 no. My husband cooked it. I am okay. very. I like. I can. I can cook steak really well and mac and cheese really well. Um, but those are really. Those are the two things I do well. I can cook, but those are my two specialties. Okay, because I was gonna say like you not only put insane hours at your dedicated craft, you also cook. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually waiting to eat my meal. Um, yeah. I made uh, dumplings, oh, uh, dude. eel, some teriyaki steak. He made gourmet. Made, uh, mushroom. Uh, I can bring um, the plate right here and show you guys, but no, I won't. <laughs> Damn, that sounds good. Stationary figure in uh, the window? In my window? Are we talking <gasps> about that right there? That Where's piece? That? I think somebody's seeing a ghost. <laughs> They're making it up. Are you making it up? I don't know. Here, that frame, that frame picture is of a sailboat. Somebody said, "Who's that shadowy figure in the window?" And Ronald put in a bit of forty dollars on the uh, Catwoman. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I forgot the actor's name for this, but you know who she? But she had, she was kind of like a brunette. Which, uh, well, here. which Catwoman are we talking? I think she was in the sixties or the seventies. Um, uh, Julie Newmar. That's the one. I think that's the only one because there was one like well, African American lady. Okay, well, it, uh, in, the, in the sixties, Catwoman was played by three women. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah but you're you're thinking of Eartha Kitt. Yeah, Eartha Kitt. Yes, Eartha Kitt. Thank you. This is Eartha Kitt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All three were beautiful women that yeah. played that role. Mm -hmm. So how, do you ever read? Do you oh, ever yeah. Read? Uh, well, I mean, oh, look, I know it's cheating, but I do audiobooks. Um, and I, I do audiobooks at double speed while I'm working. <laughs> Although, actually, what I've been doing a lot recently is listening to podcasts recorded before COVID. It is so comforting to listen to people, like, complain about the world. Um like in 2017 because yeah. <laughs> it just it feels like such a simple sweet time yeah, um, like normal it was, that was a norm yeah. but then the problem is i always like the podcast catches up to 2020 and suddenly like i'm like oh no i need to like need to check do they still record it did they survive like <laughs> <laughs> i was listening to this there's there's a medical history podcast that i found where I was like, I want to listen to anything medical that isn't about COVID. Because aside from Dr. Fauci being the sexiest man on earth, there's not a lot of good going on there, right? Okay. Um, so I found this, this medical history podcast, and I'm listening to it obsessively. It's so comforting to be like, everyone's always been dumb about health. And then right at the point where I'm like, oh, this is early 2020. And then they announce they're going on a cruise. And I listen to the episode where they're on a cruise and they say the date. I'm like, oh, wait. Is this a cruise ship where everyone died? Like <laughs> I, it was, it was awful. And then, like I, I kept listening through the COVID stuff, and it was so depressing because, like, oh, like no. one of them the doctor, and like it's just like every week is like, okay, we're not going to talk about anything funny this week. We're going to talk about what's like in the hospital right now. It's like, yeah. Um, so you know, I, I switched to different ones instead. <laughs> uh, so Richard, uh, JD, our uh, experience uh, moderator. He says he loves that. Um, it's always interesting to see how they react to lockdown. Mm -hmm. And um, he's asking, is it Sawbone? Sawbone? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what what? Um, you guys listen to the thing? I, I just got to break in real quick. I uh, I was on that cruise ship. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh yes. My God. Do tell us the story, please. <laughs> well, it was a, it's, it's a nerd cruise. It's called Joko Cruise, and they have, like, guests, comic writers, artists, and, and, you know, people from entertainment. Uh, but we, we, you know, it was just starting, like, the whole COVID um, yeah. stuff when we left. Uh, and we're all on the cruise ship, you know, getting news off the internet, finding out, are we even going to be allowed back on shore? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> are we allowed to get off the ship when we get back to Florida? It was, an, <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting experience. So, so how long did you end up staying there? 
never know him. Uh, oh, we, um, yeah, we, there was no problem. We got, we got off. Most of us, you know, picked up some, some masks for the, for the plane ride home, but, uh, there wasn't anybody got stuck there. So the first time you touch ground, like what's the first place you went in? Did you do grocery shopping like crazy? Like what to do? Uh, I, I think I got home, uh, a day before California lockdown or Los Angeles at least. Okay. So did you like go nuts and buy toilet paper and stuff, water or? No, I'm not, I don't usually panic like that. Uh, yeah. you know, because for one, I knew like if, if everything locked down, I was still going to have to leave the house to work. I'm not one of those people that can sit around. Uh, oh my God, you're a workaholic like Richard? Oh God, Jamie. No, I mean, I'm, like, I'm one of the people who can sit around. I don't have a real job. <laughs> no, I'm, I, what I'm saying is like, I couldn't afford to just sit in my apartment for two okay. years. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was kind of hard to see. Well, I don't know. There are some pros and cons uh, with it. I think we, for Mog and I, we did uh, uh, fairly well. Um, but it, it was hard to just stay cooped up in, in, in just like one spot. Um, one was kind of, uh, we were kind of lucky because um, everything was like close by. I could like walk to it. I could walk to the post office if I had to. I could walk to the grocery store. Didn't have to put gas, you know, that, that's basically all I needed uh, right there. Not much going on. Um, we could still yeah. order supplies from Amazon. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, a lot of people, they were saying like they get into more, was it? household disputes or something household? yeah but, because they're <laughs> home 24 yeah. 7 with uh, all their family members uh, and if you got yeah. a big family everybody's home there uh like one of the biggest things that we heard like among our friends is yeah my husband is home now <laughs> yeah, yeah my yeah. wife is home now <laughs> and uh, they're just not used to spending all, all that time uh uh to, together you know yeah, with so. the ass <laughs> hole you know but you know uh <laughs> But but for me and now like we are li we were living in a smaller place than this. It's just literally like one room, one room. Yeah, it was like a, it was a like a studio. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. seven hundred square foot studio. But it had Our it had everything. That we, yeah, we got we actually got better at it. Yeah. But then even before that, we were, you know, we we pretty much around each other twenty four seven anyway. Yeah. Okay. Surprisingly, I didn't want to kill him, so that was a good thing. I, this is this is the interesting thing. I think when it's just two people, um, I think it became like people start being couples and they became like the friends you make in camp. Like something is wired into us that when we are actually trapped with someone, we just don't fight. It's when you have the option to leave, but you're not really leaving. That's when like disputes start. Oh, that's why I started fighting after the yeah, yeah, like like my husband and I so my husband and I actually got separated by the, the border closures. So for the first um he was he was down in LA with me, uh and then he like look, we you know, we'd been through bird flu and swine flu and SARS and all these things that we've been promised were gonna be huge problems and never were. Yeah. So when they said COVID, we were like, This isn't gonna be real, this is gonna be another one of these, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I just gotten back from the ALA winter conference and we hadn't seen each other for a few weeks. So he came down to LA and I said, I bet people are panicking. We could go to universal studios and it'll be really empty. We'll get to the front of the line really fast. And we got there and it was empty and it was really like chilling. It was so creepy. And I was, and then I saw like one other person. I was like, don't go near them. Don't go near them. Oh, and then we went to this, um, a farewell party for a friend of mine who was moving to Florida. Uh, so I can't imagine that went well. I haven't heard from them since, so I'm not going to, I don't want to pick that scab. Um, but he, yeah, he was like a, an online friend. I didn't know him super well, but anyway, we went to this farewell party and the dumbest person I've ever met in my life was wearing gloves. And I was like, well, he's figured it out and he's much stupider than most park benches. So, <laughs> I should probably start being really serious about this. And then like we went home, Ray flew back to Canada 
uh, and then I just like <clears throat> didn't leave the house again from that point. Started ordering food, like just that. That was it. Like I would I would go to my office because um, my office is in this weird complex where everyone else was gone. Um, so it was like the the safest I could possibly be, and I can walk there. Um, and that was it. It was just home office, home office. That was it. And that was for four and a half months uh, of us being completely separated. Then he got sick of it. So he flew down to answer because we weren't married then. We'd had like a wedding and stuff, but I wasn't my divorce. My, my divorce from my previous marriage hadn't come through in time. So when we actually had our big wedding, we couldn't do the legal part of it. So I couldn't get into Canada. So he came down. He was like, we're going to like a fucking strip mall in the valley. We're getting married right now. So we did that. Uh, I went back to Canada and I was like, we'll just see how this goes and I'll come back to LA and sort things out. Then uh, Trump announces that anyone on an O class visa, if they're out of the country on June 24th, cannot come back in. And I was like, well, I was out of the country on June 24th and I'm on an O class visa. So I guess I can't go home. Um, and so like my, my former roommate now, um, like sorted out my stuff for me, found someone to replace me in the house and like, then I just couldn't be back in the U S but like, then I was just in, and my husband's old because I have never had sex with anyone under 60. Um, and so like, I'm super paranoid. I won't let him do anything or go anywhere or do anything. I'm like, we are going to be so COVID safe forever. Um, and, and we were like, until the vaccines, we just didn't leave the house, uh, or see people. And it was, it was awful for so many reasons. And the food was really boring, but like, we never fought. Then as soon as we had vaccines and then it'll be like, what are we doing today? Where are we going? Oh, I don't feel like doing anything. Why don't you ever feel like doing anything? Within somebody? <laughs> it was just immediate. That's, that is incredible. Yeah. But I don't know if I heard you correctly. You never had sex uh, until you were 60? No, with anyone under 60. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I, I had a big crush on uh, Master Splinter when I was a kid, which then transferred over to Grandpa Monster and then various other people. So when I started when I started sleeping with people, it was always old men because that's just uh, the type that developed in my brain. Mm. Interesting. I don't know what Master whatever that is. Yeah. Master Splinter from Ninja Turtles. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, like when I was four, I had a huge crush on him. I bought the toy because it had a removable kimono and I would just uh, take it off and practice kissing it. <laughs> You're going to pretend like you didn't have an equivalent. No, <laughs> well, I was never really into... Yeah, you didn't uh, have any dolls or anything like that? I, I did. My mom tried to buy Barbie, but I was like, strip clothes and torture. And stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's, that's off, her version of kissing a doll. Try to put limbs together in different ways. <laughs> I, I, she didn't let me play with fire so yeah, yeah so mog has i i took mog camping right and she didn't know how to do any of that stuff and i regret teaching her how to make a fire now <laughs> there have been many times where i've come back to camp and there's this outrageous fire did i say let me that's actually the wrong word to use bonfire that in the middle of these trees where the flames are uh, about to touch them uh, yeah so that was not a, a good thing and we're planning to go on a camping trip soon so i got a that was a great reminder so that way i know to keep the uh the fire sticks away <laughs> yeah so i was uh, anyway we have a high bid of 75 dollars from uh stevie b uh, thank you again uh for that there is a was a little bit of a bid war uh, going on there but so if you want to bid on that we are taking them of uh, increments of five uh richard has a bid on his uh danny devito yeah, penguin show us. Oh, that <gasps> is coming out it. okay oh that's a God. very nice piece and it's still at a low price of uh, 25 so let's uh get some bid uh in there uh, you guys cool. and um we are also um if you want to qualify for that free drawing there it is on the screen pound sign gamora to enter that uh, giveaway, and that is a, a, a very nice uh, Gomorrah. Um, so congratulations to the winner uh, uh, on that piece. So 
Uh, anyway, so, yeah, this, go ahead. This piece is for, I'm doing a, I'm in a weird state at the moment. I was, I was in LA for seven weeks and I was on a deadline for a couple of things. And so I was like really just not leaving the office again. And, huh. you know, you get lonely. You haven't hugged anyone in a while. Yeah. And I was, I was watching Batman Returns and it gets to the scene where Danny DeVito is uh, eating the fish with two hands in his like very soiled pajamas. And I got really turned on. And I don't like that. I don't like that that happened to me. Oh, no. uh, because I feel like that's just a sign that like I've, my brain is broken. And so I started working on this. I, I, I want to figure out why it's happening. So I'm working on a thing at the moment where I'm trying to get to know Danny DeVito's face as well as I possibly can. Um, specifically as the Penguin. Because I think he's a very cute man normally. But, like, him as the Penguin is designed to be the most disgusting thing that's ever been seen on film. So I'm trying to, like, get so familiar with him that I will, like, see the flaws or figure out what it is that I'm attracted to. I've, I've kind of reached a point where I think it's largely to do with, like, sadness. And I just want to hold him and, like, be like, if I can, if I can love you unconditionally um, and, like, make you feel attractive and valued, will you stop trying to steal all of the children of Gotham? Like, will you stop being a bad person? Um, so I'm, I'm doing a, it's, it's for a, it'll be a book. It'll be a kind of a, a, a journal with portraits mm -hmm. of Danny DeVito and other people I'm attracted to, to try and figure out the connections called, uh, I'm only drawing Danny DeVito as the penguin until I stop wanting to fuck him. Um, yeah. so this book, this, this picture will be for that, um, as well. So, so you're, you're, if anyone wants to bid on that, uh, nightmare, um, you'll be getting a, a page of a book. There you go. Okay, so wow. you got that. Um, you're not just getting a, a, a sketch a, a anymore, but it's actually going to piece that's going to go uh, into that book. So what I'm what I'm really focusing on at the moment is the disingenuous face. So I'm trying to make the the eyes look a little sad while the mouth is still sneering. Like he's still putting in the effort to seem evil and conniving, but like I'm trying to get the eyes to show that he doesn't really mean it. And I think it might be me still trying to find the best in him um, rather than like really in, embrace the fact that he's a disgusting, slimy sewer boy. Um, okay. And actually, now that I say that out loud, like he is a slimy sewer boy. And so maybe it is all connected to Master Splinter after all. Okay. Um, I have to all right. Well, you guys have time to bid uh, that that Danny DeVito penguin is still, is still at a little bit of uh, 25. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm amazed that person didn't just remove their bid after I said that. <laughs> no, no, Ron is uh, Ron, Ron likes that stuff, uh, so I'm pretty sure he, he's uh, uh, likes that information that you just showed out. He's not going to remove that piece at all. Um, and he is a, a collector of uh, artwork, he does it, he's not really into comics, so, but he likes the art, so yeah. Uh, but anyway, well, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna take a, a break right now, but before we get to that, um, the um, the bidding for the Catwoman is at 75. Bidding on the uh, penguins at 25. Go ahead and put your bids in there. You still got time. We're going to be moving into the uh, final uh, segment after this uh, commercial break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Join the party. Head over to our link tree to find all the links for everywhere the experience is all the time. What if Hans Gruber from Die Hard had to battle the Joker from Batman the Animated Series in a dance battle? Or who would win in a race between Baby from Baby Driver and Snidely Whiplash? If Austin Powers and Shrek found themselves in a hot dog eating contest, who would emerge victorious? These are the questions we talk about on Nerd Killer Warfare. Debate the most absurd questions you've ever heard in popular culture. Register now by scanning the QR code or visiting bit.ly forward slash exp casting.
welcome back. This is our final segment. Oh, so we've got, a, we've got a little time left. Um, uh, once again, that yeah. cat movement is still up for bids. we got a high bid of uh, 75 so far. And Danny DeVito Penguin from uh, Richard uh, Fairway is at uh, 25. Don't forget to uh, check out uh, Richard's uh, um, uh, website there where you can uh, check about what he's got uh, going on and get some other stuff uh, as well. And that I, I can't remember if I, I if I sent through the link for the, the pre-launch for X-Wives of Frankenstein, but if you go on Kickstarter and look up X -Y the, the X-Wives of Frankenstein one, you'll find it. Um, okay on there yeah um what kind of um what what are you uh, planning to do in your kickstarter do you have anything special going on in there um it's a it's a pretty straightforward campaign in a lot of ways like it's uh you know all the the, the book the variant covers the, the the whole the whole nine yards of the usual comic stuff i'll have prints i'll have stickers i'll have that but um I always like to have like a strange object available because I think there are a lot of people out there who who want something that they can't uh, just get. You know, every campaign has the same stuff. I want to have something different. So for my memoir campaign, because I like huff a lot of poppers when I go to sex clubs, I did a little fake bottle of poppers that has a QR code with the download for the comic in it. So you can buy a physical object that had the digital reward. And so for X Wives of Frankenstein, because she is all stitched together. I've made a little emergency sewing kit uh, with uh, the, the, her official branding on it that says like for the monster on the go and has the, the picture on the cover is, on, on the, on the packaging is her uh, one arm stitching the other one arm back together. Um, and that'll have the QR code inside it. So you get like a comic that you can take everywhere without taking up any space. Oh, um, interesting. And I've got like, there's the Steph C variant that you've, that you've been showing and we've got, um, my main cover, which is all I'm, I started doing like actual like sculpture and like physical collage stuff for it. So the, the main cover for the book is, um, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a face. The whole thing is made of paper mache made up of the 23rd chapter of Frankenstein with all of the line breaks removed. Um, because that's the chapter where he, he makes the monster a bride. Um, mm -hmm. but it's all, all that in green. And then I've, uh, in over the stitching outlined it with lipstick, which is for a moment from the book. But rather than like, I, I made the sculpture and photographed it, then uh, uh, printed out the photo and then using a light box, I traced over it to draw the character and do the line work and the shading over top of it. And then did the lipstick over top of it, rescanned those, printed them on transparency and then clipped them in front of the camera to line up with the original sculpture and then re-photographed it. Um, so it's like, I'm trying to like remove digital alteration wherever I can with these things. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I'm really interested in the idea of like creating the most immediate experience of what the real art looked like. Oh, interesting. Okay. So there's that. And then also, um, uh, Laura Helsby has done a variant cover, which is like a high angle, amazing, like cluttered room. One of the things about the bride is that because she doesn't have any memories of where her parts come from, um, she knows she used to be someone else. Her brain is from uh, someone else. So she's figured out about how old she is. So she keeps buying things online that she thinks she should be nostalgic for to try and like trigger something. So it's this room full of like old video game systems and Walkmans and, and CDs and tapes and records and um, uh, like posters for strength, like events and, and Garfield phones and Furbies and all the shit that like we all like fetishize now in the same way as like, I, I as a 38 year old really want a t-shirt where, where, where Bart Simpson is like looking like a cool gangster. Like I, I want the thing that Kmart had when I was seven that I can't get anymore. Um, so I'm not having her like really, really embrace that side of things. And like Laura just did an incredible job there, an amazing artist. Okay. Uh, so uh, the link is in the uh, comments there. So guys go ahead and click on that link and, um, uh, uh, follow the project and give uh, Richard some support. It uh, sounds like a very interesting uh, uh, series. So yeah, definitely uh, follow up on that. Yeah. Um, and you said you're going to be uh, at the uh, Long Beach Comic Con. Have you done that before? Uh, yeah, I've done that uh, four times, but I haven't been there since 2019. That was, that was the last time I did it. So it'll be nice to be back there. Um, 
Uh, I think um, my latest book that came out last month was through Fanbase Press. Uh, it's a book called Four Color Heroes. It's about two boys who fall in love with the comic books. It's like one boy from a very religious background um, who knows that he's not allowed to read. <laughs> um, he's not allowed to even look at the comic. <laughs> So Patrick sees a loophole and says, well, what if I just describe them to you? And so as their lives pull them further apart, these two boys have this reason every month to come back together and talk about this superhero comic every time a new issue comes out. And throughout the book, you never see the real comic. You only see how Oscar imagines it. And so it's always in a sort of superhero comic style, but it goes from being very naive and like a lot of like, uh, like kind of childlike misunderstandings um of what the comment what what patrick's describing to like as he just kind of picks it up through osmosis realizing what the superhero comics really look like and what's what i like about it is that i got to tell like uh six complete superhero stories within this story but all through the dialogue of an excitable 15 year old boy because i think that one of the best things about comics is often not reading them yourself but having your friends tell you why they love them right and right i like capture that and that excitement of like just just get the beats of the story in there and, and like and say and this is why that's cool because of this and you know and um so i really i, I really like that book a lot um so i'll be at at long beach i'll be signing on the fan base table probably only saturday um because as i said before like sex clubs are a big part of my life and sunday is senior discount day at slammer um so again nothing but old man so i gotta hit that okay yeah, and then uh, you'll be at uh, LA Comic Con. We'll be at there uh, there too, so we'll be able to uh, meet you there. Uh, cool. Well. All right, but then will you be there for all three days, or are you just uh, only another like one day? I think so. I I only just found out that I'm going to be in the country uh, for it, so I I've got to reach out and find out if I can get a guest table. Um, but I I I think it shouldn't be a problem. Um, so yeah, if so, I will be there all three days because. Okay. I realized at San Diego this year that I'm actually addicted to the con floor because I was, um, you know, like I'd, I'd do the show through the day, I'd go out, party all night, like whenever the bars closed, I would sort of stumble off and find some other adventure, go back to where I was staying, sleep for maybe an hour and a half, get up, go on a huge walk around San Diego, be so tired, be like, I'm just going to go do my signings and I'm going to go sleep for the day or like sit by the pool and just relax. And then I would get on the con floor and half an hour in, I'd be like, oh boy, I'm ready to go. Like, this is this is the best. And I would like just go up and down the aisles over and over and just like talk, like you always find something new. It's this big weird treasure hunt. And I ended up like, I would be on the con floor from open till close. Wow. Just in like, get and at the end of the show, I'd be like, I'm so pumped. Let's go out, let's go do some stuff. And it would get to like three in the morning and I'd be like, Back in bed, like, okay, cool. I'm, I, I should be tired. I guess I'll sleep sleep for an hour and a half. Get back. Okay, let's go walk. All right, I'm gonna go to a con today. This is gonna be amazing. <laughs> so good. I didn't realize how much I've missed it. I I know I miss it, and I wow. I wish I I could uh, do that. And I don't know. Maybe I'll show up at uh, Long Beach uh, Comic Con just so I can just walk around the floor and, and not worry since we're yeah. uh, we're not uh, tabling there. And, but. Oh. It's it, it you know and I keep telling myself that okay we're gonna go do this con I'm gonna set up we're gonna take time to go uh, walk around and say hi to everybody and see what uh, what's going on and, and check out the uh, other areas not just um, you know the, the artist alley uh, uh, section you know mm -hmm. but then it's like by the time I'm done setting up and we set up uh, kind of a a little more elaborate than uh, most uh, artists uh, do, and so by the time I'm done setting up, I'm going, man, I'm tired, you know. And I end up just like sitting down, and I, and then I go, okay, tomorrow I'll come in early and I'll walk around. Right? But then it's like there's, they don't really give you too much time, and I've got to kind of like set things up again, not as long as the day before, but you know, it, it does take time, and I want to get my coffee, I want to get something to eat, and and get all that uh, taken care of before uh, they let everybody in, right? And then they're, they're letting, they have that VIP time where everybody's coming in like a half hour early and they want you to be behind the tables oh, and, yeah. and, and and all that stuff. And I try to be respectful because I've been an event organizer before and I know how important it is that you want the people that are vending uh, at your event to uh, to do that, right? Because it's important to, uh, that the... Uh, uh, attendees 
uh, see that. And it's not just a show that kind of looks like it's falling apart. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and I think like Long Beach really suffers from uh, when they were doing two shows a year and one of them was so much smaller. And I think people put that together as being part of the Long Beach Comic Con rather than Long Beach Comic Expo. And like, it's a little disheartening when you go to a, a convention and there's like a lot of people selling jewelry and jam, you know, it, it does. And so I think like Long Beach is something where I think it really is important for us to like look as on top of things as we can because they're fighting that so hard. And it's a show that I think is like, I like the organizers. I like the, the, the way it's run. I like that it's stuck around kind of against all odds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see some of that, um, is starting to be policed. And uh, at WonderCon um, this year, we saw that. And so there's going to be, I think, if, if they're going to do this right and they follow through with it, uh, WonderCon next year will have a different uh, feel uh, uh, to it as to where they put people, how they organize it, and who's going to be uh, uh, in Artist Alley. Those are some of the uh, concerns that were brought up in the previous years. And it looks like it's something that they'll be addressing. Uh, so we'll see if that will take effect uh, uh, next year. Yeah. yeah, I think like WonderCon, I didn't go this year. I was, I was in Australia during it, but um, it's it's a really good convention a lot of the time. But the past few times, it's really felt like small press get completely screwed over. Like Artist Alley is the cheapest place to be. And you make so much more money in Artist Alley than you possibly can in small press because nobody goes there because they don't know it exists. The layout of yeah. that building stops people from ever finding it. So, so we did it the past two years. And uh, the year after COVID uh, mm -hmm. got opened up, right, we were in small press. Okay? And, you know, we did, we actually did pretty good there. Okay. So mm -hmm. this year we did it in Artist Alley. Okay. I didn't really feel a difference. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, and I haven't decided if I want to go back yet. Um, but if I do, I think I do want to go back to small press mm. right? because it's a little roomier there, space here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that way if we do have uh, sort of a line or, or a, uh, a bunch of people at the table, it'll, it'll be easier for them uh, to, to, to get to us. Whereas we're and plus, I think it makes it easier to, to find us uh, there, yeah. especially the way how we set up. Um, also, because so, there's two of you, I think it's it's just it's better to have that space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have uh, we you know besides the the um, customers that come and come and see us and 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 mob, there's also the people that have been associated with uh, for a long time in this uh, industry, mm -hmm. and they're just coming over to you know just to talk stories uh, uh, with me and so forth. So. Yeah, you kind of we kind of it kind of looks like our table has a bit of a buzz because of that. Um, it's but, a strange thing. So I like I was in New Zealand until I was thirty, and because there's so little else to do there, the conventions are enormous. Like there's six cons a year, and all of them like the smallest one is about fifteen thousand people, and it's this is still, in New Zealand itself. Yeah. yeah. Because there's cons in, in New Zealand, and New Zealand isn't that big of a country. No, it's 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 five million people, and like <laughs> you just get these enormous conventions because everyone's just like, well, what else would we do with our time? Like we look forward to this all year long, and people will travel to go to all six of the conventions, um, and so I just sort of assumed that was normal. And so like when I was doing the shows, and I, I'll 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 be honest, like I've been doing this long enough that by the time I left New Zealand. I had a 60 foot wide booth and I had a staff of 10. Like I had a lot there, but like it would just be kind of constant sales. It would just be like, just, you know, if, if we made less than $1,500 in an hour, it would be a very disappointing hour for us. And I was like, I can't wait to go to America where this is all going to be so much bigger. It must be. <laughs> and then I got here and realized that everyone in here can go and do a bunch of stuff anytime they want. <laughs> and conventions here are terrible. And I would, I would talk to people and they'd be like, like I was, I talked to this one guy, I won't say who, but he was, he was, he would always talk about how well he did at conventions and how he would talk about the numbers he moved. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. And I'm, I'm new. So I know it's going to be a little lower, but that's fine. 
And I went to some shows and I was like, well, that wasn't what he said. And I kept wondering, because his, his stuff is not, like, it's not just that it's not good. It's just that it's, it's really not very, like, distinctive. And I think in a convention setting, you if you're not doing a big two book, you have to be distinctive for people to notice. And I couldn't figure out how this guy was doing the numbers. I was like, I guess he's just lying. And then I was at um, LA Festival of Books this year, which everyone had told me would be a great show. And then I made, I, on, on the morning of the, the Saturday morning, I said, okay, but I need to know when you say a great show, how great do you mean? And someone said, oh, well, usually we can sell like 25 or 30 books here. I'm just going to hang myself right now. But anyway, um, during the show, and I had an okay weekend. I did like $4,000. It was okay. But someone came over, and, and again, I won't say who because I don't want to, I'm not talking shit about someone. That's not yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, this person comes over and I said, um, how's your con, how's, your, how's the festival going for you? And she was like, you know, it's okay. It's really hard though, because I'm right next to Wang. And he gives his books away for free at shows. So it's really hard to sell anything. I'm like, oh, that's how he does the numbers. He's just giving books away for free and telling everyone he's done well. So he's not lying, I guess. <laughs> when he says he's like, yeah, I moved 4,000 books this weekend. He's like, he's handing them out <laughs> to the people. Yeah. I guess that's a question you got you to gotta ask. And, and you do have to listen. Uh, when I do talk to somebody and we're talking numbers, I always listen with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to key in on the words they're saying. The guy said books. You know, he didn't yeah. say dollars. You know? Yeah. Well, that, that, that's that's the thing. But, like, I don't know. I think, I think, like, we are in a weird industry where, like, so much stuff about, like, the money side of it gets hidden and no one wants to say it. And I don't even, like, I think there's a lot of industries where people are um, – they're talk. They, they don't want to talk about it because of they don't want you to know that they're making more than you. I think here people don't want to say what they're doing because they are uh, really just so unclear as to how much money they they think they can. Like I think no one knows what's going on. Everything is so obfuscated. Um, yeah. And I think it, like we could do with a lot of transparency and like, you know, like we get more transparency now. If you look at like the survey every year that says like, how much money you're making in comics, what do you get from this? Obviously some people are going to lie. The numbers will not be that accurate, but if enough people answer, it gets more accurate, you know? Um, yeah. But like five, six years ago, you were seeing people reporting that they were being paid like $6 a page to draw comics. And now that would be unheard of, but it's because that information got out that there were companies that were paying six dollars a page that people said, I'm not drawing a fucking comic for six dollars a page, and neither should you. That people right. were able to go, Oh, yeah, maybe I'm worth more than maybe I should go for eight dollars, you know. And so now, like the survey this year was like, Here's a company that's only paying $75 a page, how dare they? It's like, Good, that's so much better. It's not great, but it's so much better. We're going to have to uh, put, stop it right there, uh, Richard, because we are running out of time. Oh, so, sorry. J.D., let's go ahead. No, no not your problem. J.D., let's sure. go ahead and have that drawing for the uh, um, the Gamora piece, if you can go ahead and spin that wheel. And uh, while you're watching that, um, the Penguin is at 80, and Ooh. Danny DeVito, no, the Penguin oh. by Danny Jewish Dragon wins the uh, Gamora. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and fill that. Congratulations. Uh, fill that uh, link up there with, with your name there, Jewish Dragon, and we'll send that uh, out to you. And I want to thank uh, everybody for being on the show. Uh, the Ron, your uh, Danny DeVito penguin went for 40, and I will get you that information uh, on Did that. You say 80? No, 40. Uh, 80, 80 was right. for he, he, he said it wrong. I was like, that's impossible. Yeah, I heard 80 that you said. 80? Okay, yeah, I got a mistake then. Okay, your piece, Mug, the cat woman went for 80. Oh, okay. okay. So that's where we're at. Uh, once again, I want to thank everybody uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, stay tuned for us uh, next week. We've got another special guest uh, uh, coming on, on the show. All right? So thank, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This was a delightful way to spend my evening. And we'll have you back. Yes, that's for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and next time, Mog is going to draw an ugly, gross old man, and I'm going to draw a sexy lady. There you go. We'll we'll switch it. Up. I will do it terribly. Okay. 
All right. Thanks to once again for uh, joining us, every everybody. You guys have a wonderful evening. All right. Take care now. Do you remember what it was like when you were a little kid and you got a letter in the mail? Now imagine that letter was filled with information about your favorite shows, pop culture questions, links to things you're going to want to see later, and even sneak peeks at upcoming programming here on The Experience. That's what the EXP mailing list is. Every week, we send you sneak peeks, information, and all of the relevant links for all of the shows you want to see. Sign up now on our website or scan the QR code that's on your screen right now.